Welcome to Module 4 of Biosafety Training at UWM. Primary and secondary containment will be discussed in this module. Let's begin. There are two levels of biological containment, primary and secondary. Primary containment protects people and the immediate laboratory environment from exposure to infectious agents. Good microbiological techniques and safety equipment provides sufficient primary containment. Examples of primary barriers include safety equipment such as biosafety cabinets, enclosed containers, and safety centrifuge cups. Occasionally, when it is impractical to work in a biosafety cabinet, personal protective equipment such as laboratory coats and gloves may act as the primary barrier between personnel and infectious materials. Secondary containment protects the environment external to the laboratory from exposure to infectious materials. A good facility design and operational practices provide secondary containment. Examples, examples of secondary barriers include work areas that are separate from public areas, decontamination facilities, hand washing areas, special ventilation systems, and airlocks. If your lab utilizes a biosafety cabinet for primary containment, the lab must have a standard operating procedure for its use and consistently follow the procedures 100% of the time. A few key tips to remember when using your biosafety cabinet include, it's not a storage cabinet, do not use it as one. Before and after using the biosafety cabinet, decontaminate it using an approved disinfectant. The UV lamp is not a suitable standalone means for decontamination. Make sure your biosafety cabinet is certified annually or when it's moved from one lab space to a different lab space prior to use. You may come across varying types of equipment but not all are created the same. One of these is not like the other. A laminar flow hood, or a clean bench, is designed for providing a sterile work environment, but it does not protect personnel or the surrounding environment. For use with non-infectious materials, such as making media, this would be an appropriate choice. Do not use this with potentially infectious materials, volatile or flammable chemicals, or waste anesthetic gases like isofluorine. The biological safety cabinet or biosafety cabinet protects against exposure to particulates and aerosols from biological agents. It provides product, personnel, and environmental protection. It is only for use with work with infectious agents, nuisance dust, and allergens. It is not recommended to use with volatile or flammable chemicals or waste anesthetic gases such as isofluorine. A chemical fume hood is a ventilated enclosed workspace that captures, contains, and exhausts harmful or dangerous chemical fumes, vapors, and particulate matter outside of the laboratory. It is the best choice for hazardous chemical work. Do not use it when you need a sterile environment. An animal transfer or cage change station is for animal allergen control during animal husbandry operations. It is not appropriate to use for husbandry of animals that are infected with biological agents or chemically hazardous materials. There are three types of biosafety cabinets available, class one, class two, and class three. Class one and class two biosafety cabinets have open fronts and provide protection to the personnel and the environment when used properly. Class two biosafety cabinets provide protection from the environment of cultures being handled in the cabinet. 
Class 3 biosafety cabinets are gas tight and have the highest level of protection. Secondary containment protects the environment external to the laboratory from exposure to infectious materials. Good facility design and operational practices provide secondary containment. Examples of secondary barriers include work areas that are separate from public areas, decontamination facilities, hand washing facilities, special ventilation systems, and airlocks. Consider the lab design, its structure, the air ventilation. Locate your sink. Is this sink close to the doorway um, for exit? Is it hands-free? Do your doors self-close? These are all questions you should consider when looking at secondary containment. It is required in BSL-2 and higher that you have many of these features. You should also note where your, where your autoclave is located in proximity to your laboratory space and have a plan in place for moving waste for decontamination to the autoclave from the laboratory space. Also note your types of access. Do you use keys, a key card, fingerprint access, etc.? Also note if you have doors interior in your laboratory that may link to other doorways or other laboratories on that same floor. Make sure that you meet the minimum criteria for secondary barriers as outlined by the biosafety level in the BMBL or WHO guides. In addition to all of the other lab practices, it is also necessary that you communicate biohazards to personnel and anybody else that may enter the lab space. For all BSL-2 and UP laboratories, a door sign must be posted. For BSL-1 laboratories, a biohazard symbol on the laboratory door sign will suffice. A supplemental document is available in this module on Canvas for the door sign, as well as on the biosafety pages where you may download the Word document version for your use. Make sure you include entry and exit requirements, special practices such as immunization recommendations, PI contact information with a phone number that they are always available at, a backup contact and their phone number, the biosafety officer with their contact information, the building and room number, and the date it is posted. When labeling all cultures in your laboratory, make sure that you are communicating the biohazard effectively to anyone that may have to encounter that space in an emergency situation. All vessels containing biologically hazardous agents should have the name of the agent or the source if it is unknown, the date, and labels should be clear enough for anybody to read. This concludes Module 4 primary and secondary containment.